about when the mean sum convergence of Riemannian magnitude. Okay, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. So, uh, can you uh, the voice is okay? The mic okay. So, um, I want to speak about the result of my PhD thesis on Benjamini Schramm convergence of Riemannian manifolds. So first I will introduce this concept for metric matter spaces, where it is, well, uh, so far un uh, less studied. Well, it, as we learned this week, it uh, comes from graph theory. And um, then I will explain something about characteristic numbers. I studied with respect to Benjamin Schramm convergence, state my result, and if there's time left, I will say something on the proof. So first, uh, let's introduce Benjamini Schramm convergence for metric measure spaces. So uh, some speaker claimed uh, the title of uh, the talk m m most unrelated to the uh, um, subject of the conference. I think he was wrong. Um, Okay, so <laughs> um, of metric measure spaces. So perhaps I should um, just recall the basic idea of Benjamini Schramm convergence. So just conceptually, you can formulate uh, the idea as follows. So you have a sequence Mn of some spaces, whatever it should be, uh, with some notion of volume. So I will denote the volume by this, uh, vol. And um, well, uh, but uh, the volume should be finite. Okay, now you can define um, Oh, uh, and now you can define Benjamini from convergence in different ways. So uh, you say that the sequence Mn uh, Benjamini Schramm converges if so one way to state is the following for any radius r um, the probability distribution of um, the following B X R X so this um, where this denotes the ball of radius R so this is a pointed ball so this, um, so let's think, uh, the example you have to think about is a graph. Um, <coughs> so in the, um, uh, so in the, uh, the case of graphs, this would be, be a pointed graph. If this distribution, okay, you, um, if this distribution converges, whatever this should mean, then uh, you say that um, the sequence Benjamini Schramm converges. <coughs> and another way to state it that is formally more beautiful is to say that, okay, you can do the following. So uh, first for any space M, uh, 
um, you can define the following map. <coughs> um, so you can map from M to a space of pointed spaces. where you um, map each point to a copy of the space pointed at that space. And then uh, you can um, <coughs> state uh, the above in a way that does not require any radius, simply by saying, OK, now I, can, I have this map, call it mu m. And now I can push forward this uh, volume measure, so the volume measure was finite, so I can, as I can also normalize the volume measure. So I have a probability measure for each n. So if uh, this sequence uh, converges in law, then I say that the sequence benjamin schramm converges. Uh, yes, that's uh, exactly the point, and I want to explain it now in the case of metric measure spaces. So, um, so, a, so we need a topology. Okay, so uh, the things I want to look at are metric measure spaces, so uh, spaces that consist of a set M, uh, a metric, uh, uh, and a volume. And uh, as I said here, these are pointed spaces, so what we need is a topology on the space of pointed spaces. So these are the guys I want to look at. Um, the pointed metric measure spaces. So this is also called abbreviated MM. Okay, um, and uh, more specifically, I want to restrict myself to the class. So I will denote the class by uh, PM. Um, of such, such spaces. Such that, uh, well, uh, the base point should be in the space, of course, but. Uh, what is the last letter? L? Uh, P. <coughs> the root, yes, the root. So, and uh, the metric space should be a nice, so I, it should be a proper length space. Okay, proper means that uh, the heine borel theorem is satisfied in other terms that any bounded closed set is compact. And length space actually means that to every um, that uh, I can realize the distance of two points by a path. So in other words, it can, uh, uh, what is excluded, for example, is a space, uh, a two-point space, because there is, uh, there, sh uh, there is no path from one point to the other. So this um, actually, uh, one could even drop this length space assumption, though it makes uh, easy, it, um, it simplifies matters because um, what you ca actually need is not only a topology on the space, but you want to, uh, that it is a metric space. And if you want to explicitly state a metric on that space, it's more convenient to work with length, length spaces. So but now uh, let's introduce the topology. So we say that a sequence MN converges to M as uh, 
pointed metric measure space if the following holds. If uh, for any radius and any epsilon uh, there is for sufficiently large n Uh, there are measurable maps from the closed ball of radius r. So um, these square brackets brackets uh, are the closed ball. Um, Okay, um, there are maps from this uh, space, so this subspace of M N to M, such that um, the following holds. Uh, first of all, the base point, uh, the root is preserved. Second, uh, the distortion. of these maps is smaller than epsilon. So um, the distortion means uh, the deviation of these maps from being isometric. So formally it would be um, uh, the supremum of um, uh, the difference of any two points minus, uh, of the distance of any two points minus uh, the distance of the images of these two points. And uh, secondly, you require that um, this, uh, somehow these maps uh, um, are almost subjective or su subjective on this ball in the following sense that uh, this ball around the root in M is contained in the image of the ball that is thickened by epsilon. So this is the epsilon thickening. Okay. And finally, you also have to um, uh, do something with the measure. So you say that the push forward of the measure, where I cut off the measure with a continuous function, um, well, and uh, converges to the cut off of, of the volume measure. So these function um, dp uh, is the cut off function, so it's a function like uh, that. Well, uh, now uh, if that is satisfied, we have. Um, Convergence of MM spaces actually, uh, some uh, special cases are uh, more uh, studied. For instance, if we, well, if you would reread re it with or replay, plug in for R infinity, so like uh, require these maps to be defined on the entire space, you would end up uh, with a notion of Gromov Hausdorff convergence. If you take only the first three um, assumptions, so you'd have, uh, you forget about the measure, you would have pointed um, Gromov 
Hausdorf Convergence. Okay, so, but perhaps it's more um, convenient to look at uh, this in, ca in the case of an example. So, take for instance the sequence of the following spaces, you have a circle. So now the length of two, uh, so first of all, it should be a length space. So the convenient way of a length would not be the distance from the embedding into the board, but um, the, dis uh, the, uh, the walking distance, so the length, the distance of this point to that point would be determined by going along this path. So, okay, and then now I look at the sequence of balls that become larger and larger. And the question is, uh, what is, uh, should be the natural limit of the sequence? Any suggestions? Yes. So it should be um, a line. Okay, so how does, where does this make sense? Okay, let's first go to Gromov um, Hausdorff convergence. Gromov Hausdorff convergence would mean that I can somehow find a map uh, from the circle into the line, okay. Um, but there is somehow a problem because uh, uh, I have to somehow open the circle to put it in there. So it, uh, the requirement that the distortion should be small has to be violated. Okay, so that is inconvenient. Okay, now let's go to pointed gromov hausdorff convergence. Yes, or oh, what is the, okay. I mean, you can define, you, you mean because I required there that that is the proper length space or what is the question? So, so, so you have that, so you have group of house of converges of, of, of metric spaces. Yes. It's how they can put together, this is the, this is the group of house of converges. Yes, without. Yes, how close you can. So there are different formulations of it. You can also say, okay, uh, two s metric spaces are very close if you can, can embed them so into a, a common space and they are close in this common space. Actually, that is also the way how I define the metric. Um, yeah. But uh, the, the point is that these maps are not required to be uh, continuous. So there I've got uh, only, they should be almost isometries, but they don't have to be continuous. So I can, I don't, I need, I do not need this uh, uh, spa space in which I can embed both. There are many, uh, there are, uh, well, uh, there's a couple of ways to formulate it. Um, okay, now let's go to po pointed gromov hausdorff convergence. Here it turns out that I've got more freedom. So first of all, I have to choose the base point. Okay, let's do it. And now uh, I only have to uh, find these maps for a fixed radius. So I actually have the freedom. Okay, uh, perhaps in the first case, the radius is let's say two and or four, and the, the entire ball would be included. But if I the ball be, the circle becomes large enough, uh, it would be just an interval. So I just have to define this map on an interval. And this works quite well, because now I can just map it to an interval in here. And um, because, yeah, yeah, and uh, everything works, of course, I, uh, now I can go one step further and say, okay, do I have a convergence of metric metro spaces? Okay, now I have to uh, uh, add a measure, but well, let's say I just take uh, the normal Lebesgue measure coming from uh, the real interval. So uh, in this case, it would work. Mm. But now, um, in case of Benjamin-Schramm convergence, 
let's look what's happening there. So in Benjamin Yishram convergence, I did not take any um, uh, pointed spaces, but I simply chose, so uh, I can now forget about the base point. I simply chose the base point at random. But if now I take, for instance, the uniform measure on it, I will land at, uh, uh, it doesn't matter which point I choose. Uh, it will al always be, uh, um, the spaces will al always be isometric if I take here the uniform measure on the circle. So uh, if I point this, uh, I choose this point or that point, it doesn't matter. Okay, so now uh, it uh, boils down to the pointed um, metric measure convergence we just looked at. So the interesting thing to note about, um, uh, or perhaps another fact, so uh, about this PM, so uh, theorem Um, PM can be uh, completely metrized metrized and uh, is separable. So um, Especially this implies that probability theory uh, works nicely on this space. Um, so what I wanted to say, okay, yes, uh, in case of benjamini schramm convergence, now uh, I did not say anything about a possible limit space. So on the uh, no, knows uh, that does, uh, I mean, in this, in this case, we have somehow a limit space because if I look at these, probability distributions, they will um, they will converge to the Dirac measure on the pointed real line. But in general, you don't have, uh, uh, the limit will not be a Dirac measure. I just say that this converges, okay, if I know that this space is, I know this space is complete, so I know, okay, if there's convergence in law, there is a limit distribution, but it does not have to be a Dirac distribution, it can be anything. So, um, and results, oh, good. Um, okay, so, and uh, just to mention a result on for uh, this kind of spaces, so Bowen, uh, based on ideas of ELEC, proved that Betty numbers of MM spaces converge. So to quickly state that, um, so he proved Betty numbers. are testable in constant time on some uh, class of uh, metric measure spaces. Okay, now uh, perhaps we should, I should explain something on that. So first of all, what are uh, Betty numbers for those who don't know? So Betty numbers are, um, so the zero Betty number counts the number of connected components. The first Betty number counts the number of loops. And um, 
you can think about the higher Betty numbers as counting uh, higher <laughs> kinds of loops. They are uh, an important variant in topology, but uh, what is important uh, in this case, I mean by that, um, that I uh, look at the Betty number, so I is any integer um, at the Betty number of the space divided by the volume of the space. Otherwise, this convergence, I mean, um, uh, it would not make sense. So, uh, I mean, you can already think about very easy examples like you take uh, the simplest example would just to be look at the case i equals zero, and you, for instance, take simply a number of points. So in this case, um, uh, yeah, or to, to do something better, first Betty number, and you look at uh, just something like that, many circles, and you would count the number of holes. And there, it somehow makes sense that you can, if, for instance, this, if a sequence of such guys, and you add more and more loops, it should, it, in, at the end, be something like that to both sides. And if you have here the uniform measure, you should somehow have, uh, get here the density. Okay. Um, so, in so what, what does it mean in constant time? Uh, okay, this means the following, that uh, this, this guy, let's call it phi i. So, uh, this is also called parameter. Or you can say a parameter. phi, in this case phi i, um, uh, is called testable uh, in constant time. <coughs> time if um, the following holds, so uh, uh, you, you can, ex so this parameter is defined only on spaces of, s on certain MM spaces of finite volume, but um, in this topology, especially there are also uh, infinite pointed spaces, in this space PM, so what it says, it uh, um, can be continued. to um, class, let's call it um, M, to the boundary of M. Uh, and on this boundary, uh, uh, continue to the boundary as a continuous function. Uh, to the closure to the closure as a continuous function and uh, the closure is compact And all this is in the Benjamin Schramm topology. Okay, but uh, there's of course a big question: Why it is is it called testable in constant time? Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the same. Uh, it depends on what you mean by weak topology. Well, that's not me. That's, uh, I don't know, people have been talking about weak topology. 
it's also called uh, weak topology. Yes, yes, it's the weak prob uh, yes, weak uh, convergence of probability measures or convergence in law or uh, distribution or whatever. So convergence with respect to bounded continuous test functions. Okay. Um So this is called testable in constant time because or due to the uh, following corollary, if uh, phi is testable in constant time, time on uh, on some class M, then um, for any epsilon greater than zero, uh, there is some N. And and R and a tester um, tau. So it's you can say it's a function from a point for that takes n pointed spaces to the real numbers, and it uh, does the following thing. So it, it can estimate the uh, parameter in the following sense. So the probability that um, the tester is uh, almost right. So, so uh, what does the tester do? The tester uh, is given n balls of radius r. Bp, uh, Um, okay, and the probability that this is um, larger than epsilon is smaller than epsilon uh, as soon as uh, these base points x1 to xn are uncorrelated. So well now, as I told you, I um, not uh, now. Now I'm not interested in Betty numbers, but in characteristic numbers. Don't uh, they don't have to be independent. Uh, yeah. So uh, I, I, well, I, I am also asking me, is that uh, known that it is uncorrelated? I did not find any proof of that, uh, but I think it should be known. So does anybody know? Okay, characteristic numbers. Um, so, how you can uh, think of um, characteristic numbers is like a generalization of the Euler characteristic. 
and for the um, um, Euler characteristic uh, for the Euler characteristic of a uh, surface, you might have say, seen the Gauss Bonnet formula. So the Gauss Bonnet formula states that the Euler characteristic of a surface M can be calculated as an integral um, over um, the Gaussian curvature of the surface. Mm, now, in general, characteristic numbers are an invariant even of um, vector bundles mm, of Riemannian manifolds, and there are many ways to define them. Um, the way that is crucial for me is called churn whale theory. So uh, for any um, any polynomial uh, p of degree d over two on uh, so the ring of uh, d times d matrices in C, uh, that is so any polynomial that is uh, invariant uh, with respect to the general linear group, um, one can define Uh, a D form a, a, a D form so um, a differential form in degree on the manifold form um, in terms of the curvature tensor So I think many uh, are not quite familiar with uh, Riemannian geometry. So uh, as um, you can think of the Riemannian curvature tensor, if you have a Riemannian manifold MG, so G is um, a tensor on the space M. So a guy that uh, is at any point a scalar product on the tangent space and by this Okay, I, at any point I have a scalar product on the tangent space and what the curvature tensor, you can think about it somehow like uh, the second variation of second uh, or second derivative of G. That is, co uh, but it is formulated in a way that is coordinate invariant. So for Riemannian manifold, you you can always write down this metric in coordinates, like you probably know from surfaces. But now, um, how do uh, does this uh, metric relate to metric measure spaces? So perhaps just to recall it, if I've got this scalar product on each tangent space by polar, uh, well, I especially have. Um, the 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 well the the way to uh, think about it is like I've got at any point an angle because uh, well I can use the law of cosine uh, to give me an angle and by angles I e even can speak about curvature. 
and but moreover this metric gives me uh, a volume form defined by um, in coordinates um, root of determinant of g so I'm especially here in the case of metric measure spaces mm, but now uh, okay I cannot go too much into this uh, in the, the, to the definition of characteristic numbers, but perhaps I can give or convince you why they are important. So, something um, one is interested in um, geometry of manifolds are uh, cobordisms. So, the idea is you have a many some kind of manifold and it is somehow related to another manifold. If you can find, do the following, you can somehow find a manifold with boundary. So if this is M1 and this is M2, you can find some manifold um, W such that uh, the boundary, a manifold with boundary such that one part of the boundary is M1 and the other one is M2. And now you want to understand the structure and characteristic numbers are very helpful because they are especially invariant, uh, invariants of this, uh, of cobordisms. So um, the way you uh, perhaps later we can see how it, uh, why this is uh, reasonable, but just to state a theorem, um, two manifolds M1, M2 are cobordant and uh, are oriented, rien cobordant so this means that um, uh, W has an orientation M1 M2 have an orientation and uh, uh, the um, induced orientation on the boundary parts is the orientation of M1 and M2 um, are orientedly cobordant if and only if the um, von Driagin the numbers coincide. So these are the numbers of, uh, sorry, uh, I should perhaps finish the sentence here. So I've got a D form and the, sorry, the uh, characteristic number now uh, comes out by integrating this D form uh, on the fundamental class of, by, you know, by integrating this D form. Okay, so integrate uh, D form. So we, we integrate this D form and get some real number or complex number even, depending on the kind of uh, characteristic numbers you look at, but there's a special family of such numbers, the Pontiagin numbers, and if uh, the Pontiagin numbers and the Stiefel-Whitney numbers coincide, If they coincide, then they are cobordant. And what are these Stiefel Whitney numbers? They are an, uh, a version of characteristic numbers, but in the ring Z over 2 Z. Uh, so, a varia uh, algebraic variation of that concept. But, uh, and now, if both coincide, uh, we know that they are cobordant. So, as you see, characteristic numbers are quite strong. Okay.
and perhaps I should just continue to state my result that now I think uh, you can guess. Okay, let uh, P be such an invariant polynomial. And uh, define phi P as so uh, I will denote this integral by p square brackets m. Okay, define phi p as uh, this normalized characteristic number. Then um, theorem, so now, uh, okay, it, uh, so in general, I, I mean, uh, it will not, now, benjamin schramm convergence will not hold on all manifolds because, well, why? Okay, let's say that these characteristic numbers are at least semi-interesting, so I will probably be able to find manifolds with uh, sufficiently large characteristic numbers, but I can, of course, scale any manifold uh, um, down, so it becomes very small, and uh, thereby I can certainly uh, make, uh, make a sequence of manifolds uh, 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 where the, let the volume is, let's say, constant 1, but um, this, uh, uh, the characteristic numbers go to infinity, but this would uh, contradict the fact that for uh, testability in constant time, I need th uh, that somehow this uh, parameter phi pi is defined on a compact set. Because if it's defined on a compact set and it's continuous, the values have to be bounded. So uh, somehow I have to say that it, I cannot scale down the manifolds. So I sh need some class that reflects this. Okay, and this class is uh, described by two values okay. and on the class uh, of smooth Riemannian uh, manifolds satisfying the following two assumptions. The Ritchie curvature of M is greater or equal minus lambda, and second, the injectivity radius of m is gr greater or equal i. Um, phi pi is testable in constant time. Okay, perhaps if words on this assumption, what is the Ritchie curvature? Okay, if I wanted to give a stupid uh, or non-enlightening uh, definition, I could say, okay, it's uh, a contraction of the Riemannian curvature tensor, but this is uh, somehow not how you should think about it. You should think about the Ritchie curvature as, um, uh, as uh, well, or uh, as the uh, you should think think about this Ritchie curvature bound as a bound on 
how much the volume of a ball can uh, can grow in the in infinitesimal in the small. So actually, you can make it even precise what I just said. Um, uh, where did I write it down? So yes, here. Um, so how you have to think about it, you have uh, uh, you can you have uh, so the volume of G that was this determinant. Now you can uh, on a coordinate patch you can compare that to the Riemannian volume and uh, well uh, by Taylor expansion and what you end up with is that uh, this Ricci curvature is um, uh, yes the first approximation of uh, the volume plus lower order terms. Uh, plus uh, small o to third um, third order of uh, the Euclidean volume. And the injectivity radius uh, says that um, around any point, um, um, the uh, the um, manifold looks like r to the n in uh, in the way that I can go or the way it is defined is okay I at, at each point I have the tangent space and I can go at least for uh, length i in to each direction in, and uh, this will become um, an injective map so it cannot happen that I go here in one direction for I half let's say and in another direction for I half and I will end up at the same point. So this means that locally uh, the manifold is trivial and especially I cannot do the, the scaling down trick I just mentioned. Um, so in the uh, I've got five minutes left. Okay um, so perhaps one thing I should mention about uh, uh, consequences of testability in constant time. There's not only this consequence, but a consequence that is even simpler, um, but still interesting. Uh, that is the fact that since um, phi is defined on a compact um, domain and it has the uh, <coughs> the thing, uh, it has the shape uh, something we are interested in, something that is uh, exciting over the volume. Especially, I can. Now say, okay, this quantity is bounded because phi p is defined on a, comp on a compact set and the image of a compact set is uh, compact and the compact sets uh, of uh, the complex <coughs> of real numbers are bounded. Therefore, this quantity is bounded. Now, if I write the volume on the other side, I have a bound on this characteristic number in terms of the volume. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, this bound is not known for this general <coughs> class of manifolds. So even this very, at first glance, very mild consequence is actually new. Mm, and perhaps I can say something about uh, what are the problems when you want to prove it. So the general problem is that uh, you inherit all the problems from uh, convergence <coughs> of uh, Riemannian manifolds. So, um, first of all, I mean, if you have Riemannian manifolds, you could ask yourself, is this, uh, I mean, there are many things you can ask. For instance, uh, should I take uh, metric uh, convergence of metric measure spaces or should I 
take Roman Fausto of convergence or should I take some perhaps a notion of convergence that somehow respects um, the differentiable structure so actually I mean uh, there's a metric on the spaces so perhaps I should say okay I have smooth maps and somehow the, the, this the metric tensor converges in some smooth topology <coughs> and actually this is something that uh, Miklos, Arbert and uh, Beringer did in their paper but for my purposes it is not quite convenient because this is a very strong topology but I need uh, for testability in constant time I need that uh, the domain is compact and the stronger the the more open sets there are in the topology the, the harder it it is to get something compact and actually in this uh, this class would not be compact anymore so I have to restrict to this um, metric measure space topology and of well and actually in this case it coincides with the or what, what you should expect is that it coincides with with the normal pointed gromov hausdorff topology but uh, this um, um, gromov hausdorff topology has many problems just to so I will just mention the problems. So first, you can have something called collapse. So this means let's take a torus. And uh, let's say it becomes thinner and thinner. And eventually, it, this will converge to a circle. So here you have something two-dimensional, and the limit is one-dimensional. So Yes, of course. So this is remedied by the uh, injectivity radius. <laughs> yes, I should move. <laughs> yes, of course. So uh, yes, I, I made clever assumptions. You are totally right. Uh, the second problem is uh, our singularities. So let's uh, take a, a sand glass. That's, uh, so this is a sand glass that is becoming thinner. Uh, so the, uh, it's becoming here thinner and thinner. And eventually you will end up with uh, two cones uh, glued to each other. So you have here very ugly singularity. But this is also uh, remedied by the, um, injectivity assumption and I mean also uh, the curvature as, as, uh, assumption somehow is works against singularities and uh, the third thing is that you have irregularity of the metric so what you can do is you take any uh, you take a metric tensor G that is rough let's say it's uh, it's the the end uh, you, you you take G defined on um, simply as a map from R D to R uh, 2D. So simply you write down in coordinates a metric tensor that is, let's say, only Hölder regular. And then you can regularize this Hölder tensor uh, by, uh, let's say, by mollification. So you smoothen that. Uh, and for epsilon, you choose, let's say, 1 over n. So you smooth that, and now you have a smooth metric. And these metrics, because, well, uh, gromov hausdorff convergence is very weak, converge to G, but G is rough. So you, uh, uh, you in the limit, you will have to deal not only with smooth metrics, but with rough metric tensors. So this, in <coughs> so this, uh, uh, now it becomes really hard because many things uh, don't work. Actually, what I can so what I'm using is a result of Anderson and Schieger that state that in this case I have a uniform regularity on the C alpha norm of the metric tensor. So now um, I have some regularity, but there's of course a problem because uh, these characteristic numbers I said you, you have you they are defined in terms of the curvature tensor. But the curvature tensor, if you look at uh, your uh, textbook in Riemannian geometry, somehow involves the second derivatives of the metric tensor. 
So I have to somehow um, uh, find tricks to, uh, to, to show convergence of something that does not exist in that way. But I think I'm already a bit over time, so uh, let's stop here.